All right. So uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this talk. I'm really, um, really glad you, so many of you are here, even though it's just after lunch. So I know there'll be a lot of uh, after lunch dips. If you want to uh, sleep, it's fine. You don't snore too loud. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't get offended. Uh, very important thing at the end of the talk, and I will show all questions collected on Slido. So you can access Slido with that code, and uh, please bombard me with feedback and question and uh, and you know insults, whatever comes to your mind. Did you add that after this morning's keynote? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Uh, that's why the code uh, the code is uh, needs to be unique. Anyway, um, just a little detail about myself. I actually studied in Lille, um, in the north of France, as you may know. It's very close to the uh, border with Belgium, and. Um, I have, I really have amazing memories of Lille, and I know that Lille doesn't have the best reputation in France, but I really loved it. And if you're not familiar with it, just go, uh, go explore a moment. And uh, actually, wanna say something that some someone told me when I was there, that is, au nord, on a des dents les soleils qu'on n'a pas dehors. How, how how cool is that? Um, well, I. I guess I liked living in Lille so much that I ended up living even further north, because then I moved to Amsterdam shortly after. Um, I work where I work as a software engineer. I have my little consultancy company, and uh, but I'm also very much involved with the community. So I founded and grown the meetup Reactive Amsterdam uh, in 2015. Uh, we're about 2,000 members strong now, and we do everything reactive. So. Uh, uh, reactive programming, reactive system design, which is what this talk is going to be about. Uh, I also organized my own conference. Uh, well, not alone. Uh, it's called Kubernetes Community Days. Uh, we've done the first one this year in 2019, uh, and it was a lot of work. So uh, big respect to these conference organizers of Scala.io. Um, this is really a great event. Uh, anyway, community for me is the most fun part of software development and our jobs. but. Our job, I think, comes also with lots of frustrations. And uh, the ones that I could think about um, th that it affected me the most in my, in my career are, for instance, that projects don't get allocated enough time. Uh, you don't get time to uh, improve the brittle system because it just works. Anybody had this in their career? Yeah, lots of nodding. Um, Another one, really, really great one, is that the, the, the product owners disregard the ubiquitous language from DDD, the domain-driven design terms, because for what business is concerned, you can also call it Joe. And uh, well, another one, uh, working at a product-oriented company where tech is only a cost, and so they're striving to reduce costs. Mm, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a very long list. Uh, I'm sure we all have our fair uh, stretch with those, but uh, for me, something that really helps is side projects. Side projects really bring me back that energy that I lose when I'm frustrated on my job. Um, you can learn whatever you want, you can choose what to learn. Uh, it recharges my battery, um, it makes you accomplish something. In general, you control the entire little world you are creating. It's all in your hands. So this talk is really about one side projects of mine. Um, who is familiar with this screenshot? One, two, a few, a few. All right. So I guess you guys, and, and how many people have had or invested in cryptocurrencies or explored a little bit? Yeah, some, some, some. Good. So this, for who, people who don't know, this website is CoinMarketCap. Shows us uh, the history of cryptocurrency, their values, but also the market capitalization. So you could say it makes a rank of the most important cryptocurrencies out there. And of course, Bitcoin or Ethereum are two very, very important ones. And then someone, one day, decided to create another website called CoinMarketCal. Oh, sorry. This one, CoinMarketCal. Just changing one letter. I mean, this is, it created me, I mean, naming is already difficult, right? Uh, anyway, this CoinMarketCal website, what it does is has a number of event categories. So, for instance, a community event, a conference, or a, a fork, or a release of a new product. Um, and these events are related to one coin at a time. 
So one typical event you could see here is, uh, yeah, on this date, 16 of October, there's going to be a hard fork about this one particular coin, uh, and so on. And it's, it's a stream of events that just comes. And so I thought, what if I could collect enough data where one day I'll be able to correlate an event and a relative cryptocurrency with its price fluctuations? Ain't that interested? interesting? So ideally, we're looking for something like that, a function that takes a coin and an event category, and it outputs like a price variation with some confidence. So for example, maybe there's going to be a conference about Ethereum on this day of the year, and I can reliably predict that its price will go up 10%. So and go buy before the event, sell after the event. Um, so I, I ventured into this as a side project, and I had two, two lines of learning that I wanted to do. Uh, the first one, uh, apply the Lightman Reactive Architecture principles. Uh, there is, a, there is a, um, a course online you can take for free, uh, but also explore the life, the life cycle of a data project. And so this book here, The Art of Data Usability, uh, I, I, would, I would highly recommend it, but I can't because the MIP has been canceled. It was almost finished, and then they canceled it. I do have a PDF copy, though. <laughs> so um, that, that's where I'm going to stop, but you can come talk to me after. Um, and so I named this side project Katerina, as the name of the, my niece that was just born back then. And I actually uh, blog blogged about this quite uh, extensively. So let's dive a little bit into the data aspects of this. Something I learned from reading that book is when we're doing a data project like this, what we are really doing is trying to climb the pyramid of wisdom. Um, it sounds like it comes from an Indiana Jones movie, but wh what, what it is is the, you, you start collecting raw data, you organize it into information so that it's structured. From that, you can extract knowledge, maybe patterns, and then once you have them, you, ha you can apply some wisdom to it. So in our case, we're going to collect data about crypto events and related coin fluctuations. Uh, we organize it into information. We try and find price patterns as a result of an event. And eventually, we'll be able to make reliable prediction. Yeah, I see, I see, I see you are quite, there's, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, something else I learned from the book, you don't need to read all this, is thinking of data and engineering project into a few phases. So there's maybe the, the design phase, uh, the collection phase, management processing, and all these phases come with some relative questions. So uh, for instance, the dissemination phase here at the end, how will, how will I make my results available? Or even very important, the closing phase, what happens when I stop working on this project? How do I give it a closure? Now, each of these phases come with uh, lots of questions. Um, you're not supposed to be able to read this, it's just to show you that I've done my homework. And, uh, but so yes, for each phase you start asking questions such as, uh, you know, uh, is the data structure properly documented? And, and, and things like that. And you, once you answer all those questions, then you're pretty much set to move into implementation. Um, which we are going to do in a reactive manner. Starting with event storming. Has anybody used event storming? Okay, one, okay, a few, a few shy hands up. So the idea, is, the idea behind event storming is we try and take our real world domain and model it in terms of events, so stuff that has happened and reactions to those events. So here in this map that we're going to fill briefly, you see that there's an input column, and then there's some internal processing area, which is our world that we have control on, and then output, which is what our system is going to emit. And so in my case, I want to monitor events about cryptocurrencies and their price fluctuations. And I decided to check, for instance, for new events once a day. So we'll have one event from the outside world, which is a new day has come. Now, to each event corresponds a policy. 
So those pink boxes are about policies. So the idea is when a, an event happened, I want to do this, which in my case is check crypto events. Each policy then will generate a command. So what do I actually concretely do in blue? Pull my event API of CoinMarketCow. And what happens as a result of a command, you do some processing and you will have more events generated by it. Um, so in our cases, we could have that there's a new crypto event announced or maybe the polling failed and so forth. Each event then corresponds to a new policy, what you want to do, and the policy will generate yet another command. So this is a bit of a simplified version, but once you do all the exercise, you have a great sketch of what's, you have a great understanding of what happens in your world. Um, and then as you can see, we finally got at the end on the other output where there's a forecast being issued, like, you know, buy Ethereum now, or maybe there's an alert when things uh, go wrong. Um, so I started with this and I, I, and I have some ideas about, you know, maybe training a uh, machine learning model to do, uh, to do our, our predictions. Um, we need to, uh, to do lots of things, but here it gives us a pretty solid view of what's happening. And now, there's one more important thing. These yellow stickies that just appeared, they represent who's going to do that. So for instance, here, there's going to be one guy called event that is going to be in charge of checking if there are new events. But then there's a guy called coin who's in charge of checking the price variations. So in domain-driven design language, we are sort of sketching out our aggregates and what is their area of expertise. Once we have this, we can create our bounded context. So in this case, I decided to have two bounded contexts. One is the crypto service, called it. One will be the prediction service. And generally, this guy monitors our APIs for events and price variations, and then the way they communicate, it's this uh, event bus. I chose Google PubSub, could be a Kafka or anything like that. And then there will be our prediction service guy in charge of actually organizing our data, structuring it, and trying to make sense of it. So from, from event storming to this sort of bounded context and their APIs. And then one level of abstraction lower even, if we take one of them, the crypto service, we can expand it and see inside the aggregates that live there. In this case, there were two, like this alert is a bit of a side one, but the most important one, event and coin, that will take care of monitoring events and coins, coin price. And so if we expand on an aggregate, I can see how I can organize this in, uh, well, actors. We're going to use ACA for this. A and same thing here. Uh, and again, we go deeper, and so we're going to look at one of the actors now for this example. But before we dive into this little box here, I want to take a little detour and talk about streaming so that we have a common ground for everybody. Um, streaming, thinking in streaming, thinking in streams. It's, it's super important nowadays and you hear it everywhere because many processes can be modeled as a stream. So, for instance, here, we could see this thing as a stream of birds. Or, for instance, what is a stream that we see here? A stream of Dutch people, yes. <laughs> yes, it's a stream of Dutch people. <laughs> but also heard someone saying a stream of cars. Equally true. Um, uh, so, uh, something important that we see from this picture is that actually one of the challenges of streams is that they, they probably change their rate over time. So maybe at 9, in, this is probably 9 in the morning where everybody goes to work, but probably at 3 at night there will be a lot less bicycles on the road. So the, the frequency of items in a stream can change uh, dramatically from very slow to, to very fast or very busy. Uh, another cool thing about streams is that you can transform the streams. 
So in this example, what do you see? It's also Dutch people, yes. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a stream of customers that want to pay at the counter of a supermarket. And one, once one of them reaches the end of the line, the stream is going to be transformed in an item of items to check out, and so on. And really, once you start thinking about it, you can model lots of real life uh, examples with this stream. So just to recap one, one slide, and then we go back to our main example, a stream is, is a potentially unbounded stream of data that flows in a sequential fashion from a producer to a consumer. And the challenges, well, one, we have already mentioned it, um, the consumer cannot predict how, well, yes, the consumer cannot predict how much data it will need to handle. So if you're the, on the receiving side, you don't know exactly how many bicycles you're going to have. Uh, you can estimate it, which is what we're, we're, we'll try to do, but you don't know exactly. And then, again, challenge two is that the production and consumption rates can be very different and change over time. Producer might produce stuff faster than a consumer can consume and things like that. Uh, but so th this was just to close our little detour, um, a way of really thinking and looking at things in, in stream terms. Um, it so happens that the, li the Lightband guys have created Akka Streams, which is uh, a library, probably most of you are you familiar with it, Akka Streams? Yes, oh, lots of people. Yeah, great. So Akka Stream takes in, 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 into account all these challenges. And so going back to our initial problem of cryptocurrencies of events, well, we could map our, our uh, event collection flow into something very simple. Once a day, I'm going to check if there's new events. And then if there's something, I'm going to put it on my, uh, you know, my message broker. And then I will tell it to someone, the, my coin aggregate, that will start following the prices. And now what's, what's powerful about this way of modeling, actually, I'm going to get rid of this. This is pretty hot. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> um, so here we are. We sketched our events collection flow into four blocks. Now, what, what happens is, of course, each block is more complicated. So if we want to go inside this, this event request flow block, for instance, actually it needs to do a lot of things. We need to get an uh, authentication token, and then prepare a request, uh, execute the request. The request might fail, so there might be different ways uh, according to what the request told us. And maybe one of the failing cases of 401 were unauthorized because our token has expired. And in this case, we trigger an authentication request flow. But the authentication request, request flow, guess what? It's complicated on its own. We need to, uh, again, ask for a new token, which maybe was invalid, maybe our credentials are expired or something. So as you can see, you dive deep and it gets more, more complicated, but the power of it is that this can all be abstracted. And Akka Streams, is a perfect API to model this kinds of flow. Uh, let's have a look at how we can model it. Um, the, the, starting with this top one, these four little blocks, in code, it would look something like this. We have a source that once a day tell us to check the new events. We pass it to the event request flow, and then the event uh, pops up for the event broker. And then for each, each event that went through this, stages, we're going to tell the coin guy so that it starts checking uh, the prices. Now, um, as, a, as a bit of a side note, you typically want to put this kind of code inside an actor. So if something explodes <coughs> within this thing, then the actor itself <coughs> will, be, uh, will, will notice and will restart it and will take care of failures. Um, and so there is this kind of API in Akka Stream where we can like in this sort of flow mode describe our things, but there's also the, another way to describe our flows using the graph DSL, <coughs> which we usually use for more complex cases, like this one. Um, in this case, we have the event request flow, remember where at some point we want to check, the get a new authentication token and go back and start again, where you have this sort of flows you want to use this uh, graph DSL language, which is basically you represent your flow like this. And what, what is powerful about this representation is that it really maps one-to-one -one our boxes. 
So <coughs> the prepare request, you can map it here. Uh, see the HTTP flows are there. The authentication request flow uh, and so forth. Um, I'm not going to go into detail how to implement this. I just want to look at this request filter right here. This, this block here is quite interesting that needs to check. Um, <coughs> well, it's implemented like this. We're going to have a partition component, which tells us that there's going to be three possible outputs. And then based on the result, uh, the status code of the response, we're going to get a different output. So if it's OK, we go 0. And yeah, <coughs> so 0, we go out, we continue. If it's unauthorized, we go to the first gate, which is actually this one here. And then ev ev everything else will go to an error failure sync right here. And these numbers that you see here, 0, 1, and 2, are actually the ones that we have already seen here uh, in, this, in the step before. So request filter 1 will go to the auth request flow. <coughs> have you uh, used these things in production ever? Yeah? Happy with it? Yeah. It's really, really powerful. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> wow. Well, if I stay alive, I can show you the next slides. <coughs> so, well, to conclude this part, we started from our event storming idea, and then we modeled into a bounded context and the APIs between them. We looked inside one of them and looked at our aggregate level, and then looking inside one aggregate, looked at our business logic, and only at the end, we have written some code. And my friends, this is a very standard procedure. Of course, it changes by project. For reactive system designs, these are five very crucial steps. Usually, almost all projects fit in something like this. And one of the first learning that we can take from, from, from this looking at this is that designing reactive systems is not jumping straight into code because we are all tempted to do that just start hacking things together that's what we do all the time but this kind of thinking things through for me at least it's really beneficial really important um, well so we have implemented all this it works as great is resistant resilient to failures is everything we need now how, how do we deploy it uh, of course, we like cloud-native stuff. I'm not going to say much about this. Um, I chose Docker and Kubernetes uh, running on Google Cloud. Um, I actually have another talk about this. I did a webinar with Lightband at the beginning of this year. Uh, and there I have a repo uh, where I show how this is um, nicely done. Um, side note, you see there's a lot of Google products uh, happening on these slides. I'm not endorsing them, but I, I really like them. Um, I worked at a lot of companies with AWS, and I don't know, to me, Google uh, just works better. So um, I'm not endorsing it, but I kind of am. So um, see, see for yourself. Uh, well, the only other thing I want to share with you about cloudization is this is the invoice that Google uh, used to send me every month. And that's another good reason for me to choose Google. It's very clear. You can see most of the expense comes from uh, my virtual uh, machine running in Virginia. Uh, all in all, it was 18 euros a month, so nothing really, really extreme. But so now we've been running this thing. We collected all this data. Are you ready for some results about this? Well, the first thing I want to share with you is I made errors along the way. Uh, for instance, the events API just a stupid example, used a symbol to identify a coin using Miyota, right? Yota I is like IoT, is like a cryptocurrency for the Internet of Things. And so I would look at their symbol, Miyota. Not, not sure why the M is there. But the rates API, so the coin price, used Yota without the M. And so 
I did this mistake of only checking this thing after two months that it was running, so I lost a couple of months of uh, of measurements for this. Uh, but then I corrected, went ahead, and at the end of the day, I collected this kind of stuff. So six months observation, 2,000 events, over 20 categories of events, about 500 currencies, and in a total of 500,000 measurements of price now what to do with this 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 is the i was i mean i was pretty scared when i looked at this like oh my god what have i done um how to look at this well I, i'm no data scientist so let's do it basic steps we can check for instance the average price so this slide is about an eternity event eternity is a cryptocurrency and uh, a release event they were releasing something <coughs> on the 26th of November. And this is the price fluctuation before and after. And I can check the average. So in this case, uh, I have this average before and average price after. So in this case, the average price was uh, lower after. But then when I try and look the average for all the events I collected, it looks something like this, which means that in 75% of the cases, the average after the event was higher than the average before the event. Huh, that's, that sounds interesting. Only in a few cases, it was lower. So picking another random event, um, this one about Ethereum, it was a conference about Ethereum that took place on the 1st of November 2018. Clearly, the average is higher after the conference. And so, well, Hmm, we're, we're, we're getting somewhere here. But that's not the whole story. Um, ideally, you want to buy and sell at this point in time, right? To maximize gain. But what happens if I do this? So the average is not the whole story. Uh, you definitely want to avoid losing money like that. Uh, how could we go about this? Um, I studied a little bit, I've done a lot of experiments with the variance and standard deviations and all these things. Um, I'm going to keep it simple, but something useful I found is actually inventing my own uh, sort of measurement. So I introduced these two ideas. The spread in our case would be how much, like the distance between the worst possible loss and the best possible gain. So let's say the green one makes me gain, I don't know, 40 euros, and the, the red one makes me lose 20 euros, then the spread would be 60. Out of which the positiveness, I called it, is how much of it is in the green. So the idea is, um, if I find something where the positiveness is reproducibly mostly in the green, well, then I'm set, right? Uh, so I looked over my events and I tried and plot everything. So the spread distribution turned out to be something like this. Uh, so the spread, it was quite contained, which means that, um, okay, like that maybe there's not too much variation, but still, I mean, um, if it's, we don't care if it's very big or very large, we only want to see in percentages. And the positiveness distribution though, that's the first hint that something is not right. It looks quasi normal thing, centered around 50%, which is a first hint that maybe tells us that events don't have a huge impact on coin price. But there is still a sizable place where it looks very good. If I can find what's happening in here, where I have a 95% positiveness, that means that I am very likely to make a profit before and after the event. So I try to explore that, that area a little bit. And what does come out? If I set a query, let's say, where I want all the events where the positiveness is greater than 85%, where I have an event category appearing at least five times in the data set and a coin appearing at least five times in the data set, well, this, this boils it down to 31 events in total, which is not many. Plus, if I apply the all three 
criteria at the same time, it boils down to one event category, which is community events, and one single coin, ladies and gentlemen. You ready to know which coin it is? It's a blockchain called Holochain. And that vaguely scary O there is their symbol. Um, it's a blockchain written in Rust. They describe themselves as BitTorrent plus Git plus digital signatures. Good luck in understanding what that means. Their symbol on the market is actually hot. I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, uh, it started trading in May 2018. And uh, I checked yesterday, actually. And yesterday, it was number 38 in market capitalization. So that's not bad, with an all-time high of $25 million. Um, it's not, it's, I mean, yes, uh, we could maybe hope for better, but it seems like we have found something consistent. However, <laughs> there, uh, uh, I, I, I looked at all the community events related to this, to this coin, and uh, they weren't uh, very world-shattering. One was some Los Angeles meetup, one was a hackathon in Amsterdam. I, I didn't go, unfortunately. There's a Switzerland meetup called Think Outside the Blocks, which is kind of smart. Uh, and so other events like that. So, in fact, only five out of ten observed community events gave me those fitting criteria that I mentioned before. So, probably these positive results were likely coincidental. So, my outcome of my analysis is, in fact, I can't really confirm nor deny that there's a link between events and price fluctuations, because I didn't, I didn't have enough data. That's what I realized. And the real big problem is the event data set grows too slowly. So let's say Bitcoin, the most important cryptocurrency, yeah? Maybe there is, I don't know, 30 events per year? That's not a lot. That's not enough to find some reproducible patterns. I mean, and the, and the cryptocurrency world moves just so quickly that um, even, if, even if I got, like, this, this data is way too little. I mean, by the time you collected something, things have already changed too much. So, uh, so well, in conclusion, we're nearing the end. Um, I couldn't really find any, uh, any reproducible pattern there, but uh, I definitely learned a ton. We, what we have seen right now is this approach to reactive architectures. The you know the five steps I mentioned. That's that's really, really important. I learned that data is never too much, and if you don't if you leave it unchecked, it misbehaves. Uh, and then yeah, this value of planning things before hacking together. Um, to me, that uh, I'm I'm the first. Uh, sinner here, uh, but uh, it, it really helps. Probably the most inspiring thing that I would like to share with you today, though, is uh, that it's actually possible to finish side projects. <laughs> you uh, you actually can finish it, especially if you think before. How will I how will I kill this? Like before you start, you already know how to. You're gonna close it. This this for me was really motivating. You know, think with the end in mind. That's what some people say. Um, here's a few references of the stuff I talked about, um, blogged about it, uh, free ar reactive architecture course, and so forth. And that's what I had for you today. Thanks, everybody. Um, I have uh, somewhere a browser. Oh. No questions. No? Oh, there's, oh, wait. Somewhere here? Uh, no. Well, anyway, no questions on Slido. But do we have time for some questions live? Cool. Any questions about this? Yes. Ah, thank you.
Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. I had just a very small question. Could you go back to the previous slide so we can take a picture, in, actually? Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. OK. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Maybe the, yes, thanks a lot. And the, I, uh, no, I have a real question. You <laughs> talked about Google PubSub. Yes. It's not um, inside the, the same ACA stream that you have the whole thing, though. So you have a, probably a first ACA stream, then it go, goes to Google PubSub, and then another, I guess? Yes. And then the second service listens to Google PubSub. And uh, the, the benefit of this was mainly that Google PubSub has a durable queue. So if the second service explodes, then the first one can, you know, keep put messages there, that, and these matches messages will just wait for the uh, other service to come alive again. Thank you. Other questions? One right here. They really want to make you exercise, buddy. So have you compared a, a batch solution? Uh, have, you, have you thought about a batch solution for your, your service because it's once a day? Uh, uh, yeah. But maybe it was for, for, to learn, I guess, uh, stream, a reactive uh, architecture through Aka Stream. That was the goal of your your site project. Yeah. But but you, you could have done that with a batch solution as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could. Well, a once a day was mostly because the CoinMarketCow event updates its events once a day. Um, but yeah, I could have batched things together. Yes. No judgment, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah <just a> question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Don't be shy. One question. Uh, thanks for the talk. Can you tell us a little bit more about the comparison between AWS and Google has platforms? Because that sounds, you have your own <laughs> opinions. <laughs> Uh, yes. So, how many of you work with AWS? How many of uh, how many of you work with Google? Way less. Yeah. So, AWS is 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 the the first one that you know the biggest all of it. Um, to me, there's two things. First, documentation. Every time I look for something in the AWS documentation, if it's like looking for a for a needle in a haystack. It, it, it's so impossible to find what I exactly need. And when I find it, it's so verbose. Um, and Google, to me, is way cleaner and approachable. I think would say that's cost. Um, I'm not sure, but I think AWS is still a bit cheaper. I'm not sure for Kubernetes, though. I use the Kubernetes managed service, and Google was the first one. So maybe that might be cheaper, but I'm not sure. But to me, documentation is the deal breaker. Well, do we have time? Any more question? If there's any? None? Oh, yeah, one. Hi, thank, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Uh, just a question: uh, Do you have any? Uh, did you found? Did you find any limitation to, uh, for Aka streams? Because uh, uh, in our team, we worked a bit with the uh, actor systems, but not with the, the streams themselves. So do you have any comments on the... Um, I think I have two this? limitations, but they're quite minor. The first one is uh, it didn't work very well in a clustered scenario. So if you have a stream, that it, you can only have a stream within the boundaries of one service. Uh, but in fact, they changed that recently. So... Uh, so that, uh, that limit is actually gone. The second one limit, I think, is the propagation of more information. So if you, uh, if you think about, the, um, for instance, I, ju I just want to take back one slide to, uh, uh, to, to, to mention what I'm saying. Um, so here, we had this situation where you have a, a line of customers that then transforms each one into a line of items to pay. But what if you want to maybe carry together with this item, you want to carry, for instance, the name of the of the guy that wants to pay. Like in general, you want to carry some information from one step to the other one. That's kind of cumbersome to me. Um, I always end up using other tuples 
or yeah or uh, maybe a, an, a container object that but it's kind of dirty still because in the beginning your container object will have a lot of empty fields none and so they get filled as soon as you go through the stream so yes carrying the context i think i don't like it very much and yep thanks A recent uh, feature of Akastream uh, allows to 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 give a uh, context yeah. that can flow the stream uh, with context yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Have you used it? Not, not mm. yet. But, uh, I, I, will, I have, I've seen it, but I haven't used it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe that solves this problem. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. One more question. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank uh, actually, I have a question about uh, event storming. So you. S Basically, the idea is to have a collaboration and discussion between business people and technical people. So I'm wondering if you did it that by yourself alone or you <laughs> challenged <it laughs> your work with somebody else? Yeah, excellent question. <laughs> For this side project, I did it by myself. It was a conversation with myself. Um, I learned a lot about myself during that. Um, but yes, in general, it should be more collaborative between different uh, areas in your company. Yeah. Um, Yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So you you check the correlation between um, the price and when an event occurs. Yes. But did you check when um, uh, the event is announced? Because sometimes people just um, uh, you know um, buy the rumors and sell the news. So maybe you could check uh, when the event is announced and not when the event occurs. Uh, yeah. True true and i haven't i haven't done that um i didn't do that and uh, but that's very true so if someone wants to try and becomes millionaire my uh twitter is uh right there uh please let me know something else i didn't try is actually some events like listing of a coin on an exchange you know when it becomes tradable they are usually the events that make the price go up but they don't tell you beforehand so uh, it's so it's impossible to know, or they try to keep it secret until the very last minute. So um, yeah, checking the price when the event is actually announced is is a great idea. I'll go back to my data set uh, after the talk, uh, but I haven't tried it now. It was a question on um, domain modeling or bounding context in general. So organization I work for is such a, well, it's a government organization, but systems are so old, why <laughs> you're talking from the 1970s or the, the organization has grew so large organically over time, even the business representatives lose context of what their domain is. Is there any tips or techniques you can do to actually help identify what those are and really at the core what they're responsible for? Yes, I think I think the only way to get out of this uh, of this death trap is uh, if you have this massive system that nobody understands. Try and split a little bit first, and try to model that and see. Like try and find a part of the system that has the least ties possible with the rest. Uh, I think it's the only way. Uh, just break it down into smaller pieces. Okay. Um, so I suppose my other question to that then is. How do you stop large delivery teams, sort of 50 plus teams, duplicating microservices in effect then? Because if you, so if you locate it geographically across the country, mm. you've got many different delivery centers and you're trying to do that in each team, you're bound to come across duplication. Yes. Um, which I've seen happen as well. So it's trade offs either side, I suppose. Uh. It's hard question, I know, without it being in Yeah, context. I think, I don't know, it sounds very specific. Yeah. So, um, no, yeah, try and break it down and, I don't know, that's, yeah, I don't know. Don't okay. know about that really. Thank you. Uh, I think that might be it. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.